Okay, well, this is already the best panel discussion that I've ever <laughs> participated in, um, from hieroglyphs to uh, encyclopedias. It's been great. Um, but yeah, we should get started. So uh, this is application monitoring. Uh, my name is Ben Sternthal. I'm a program director at uh, OpenJS, and um, I work with Robin. Hey, Robin. And um, I've been with the foundation for a little over a month, um, and it's been really great. And I'm really happy to be here with you and really happy uh, to meet these fine folks that we're going to be paneling with. Um, so yeah, I'll let uh, Zoe and Steven introduce themselves. So, You want to go first? Sure. Uh, hi there. I'm Steven. I work at Datadog. I've been doing APM stuff for like about a decade, Just building all sorts of diagnostics tools. It's fun. My name is Zoe Steinkamp, and I'm a developer advocate at Influx Data, which is a time series database company. I started there as a front end software engineer on our React side, and now I work as a DevRel. So, we got some questions we want to go through, but this is a pretty intimate space here. So, we're thinking um, we'll try and leave some time at the end for a question and answer uh, with folks. But that being said, so uh, let's start off with some of the basics. So, let's pretend hypothetically that I don't know anything about application monitoring, as hard as that is to believe that I'm not an expert. Um, so I, first question here is just, you know, how would you, how would you define this and why is it something that's important? Why should I care? Uh, like, uh, application monitoring is pretty much just about like knowing what your system is doing and why, uh, particularly for like ev every application is going to do something wrong at some point. You told it to do the wrong thing, you wrote a thing not quite right, some user did, is like trying to hack you or, I don't know, there's like a billion reasons why a thing cannot do what you, th like what you think it's gonna do. And so like it, it helps to have just continuous monitoring for like someday there's gonna be an edge case, like you, you can have a route that like, you, you think this is like, Oh yeah, I'm just surfing a static file or something. Like, not, not, nothing could ever go wrong here. And then someone's gonna like send a weird header or something and just crash the entire server. It's like, if you aren't looking at it, you won't see why that happened. Right. Right. I would say I, we normally define application monitoring as building a better user experience. That's the big thing: is to make sure that uh, your end users are happy. Which yes, normally involves things not crashing. They're you know, fiddling around as much as they want to and they're not having any issues as they do that. They can click all the buttons and they all go green. It's a great day. And why it's really become more important, especially over the past couple of years, is once upon a time when Wikipedia began, um, we were a little more forgiving of things not quite working. You'd be willing to wait a little bit while your website loaded and maybe something broke every now and then and you'd tolerate it. Nowadays, you don't tolerate if your apps don't open immediately and if they open and they have weirdness going on, you just close them and you might even delete them. There's no tolerance anymore for things not to just run smoothly. And especially nowadays in businesses, there's no tolerance at all. When GitHub goes down, it's like a major problem. An entire company's now all their developers are just kind of sitting there like, I can't believe we relied upon this system. Damn them all. Even if they've only crashed, you know, once every five years or something, it's still aggravating on that on that day of. So that's also why it's become so important, though, especially in the past, like I said, five to ten years. I, I, I slightly miss the like old under construction pages. <laughs> but when, when things go bad, you can just put that up and be like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're progress is happening for sure. So for say new engineers that maybe aren't working on something that's that's as important as GitHub, but still important that that deserves monitoring. Like, what kind of advice do you have them when they're starting out on uh, thinking about how to monitor their applications? I would say one thing to keep in mind when you first get started is think about how much of, I'm going to call it the triangle. Think about how much of the triangle you have. That's going to be your time, money, and developer energy is what I'm going to call it. Think about how much of those three things that you have because sometimes at the beginning you actually have quite a lot of time and developer energy because you're just working straight up in the project and you just have the time to do it. In which case, you can look more to tooling that might be a little bit more open source, a little more custom, a little bit more work. But obviously, at the beginning stages, I hear a lot of people say, I don't want to pay for this. I don't even have any customers, or I have very few customers. So that's a great solution in that time zone, or that, that place where your company's at. But if you're a bit bigger, and I will say this, most bigger companies are monitoring quite a few things. It's, they don't get big without monitoring, I can assure you of that, because then they crash. 
Um, at that point in time, it becomes a lot more about what solutions can I find that meet my needs immediately. My developers do not have time for this, and they want solutions that work right out of the box. So that's definitely something to keep in mind is how much of this you can afford to put towards it. But do also keep in mind, I would rather have a monitoring system kept together with duct tape and hope than absolutely nothing, because nothing is the worst case. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's like it, like the application performance monitoring space is kind of like really giant, wide space full of like huge variety of products. Um, and like that, that can be intimidating to like new users and like there's a lot of focus on like particular types of things like like tra tracing like every every company like forever has tried to sell tracing as like the core thing but like actually like that that's tracing is the thing that like bigger companies that like really understand what's going on want but like for most companies like actually profiling is more what you want like just get show me statistically what the thing is doing most of the time i'm going to look at the top couple things and make those a little faster and that's like the extent of the work that most companies are going to do but yeah like a lot of the tools in APM are for, like they're for the more advanced organizations that are going to like dive deep into everything and it's like you kind of need to like have a starting point and then like start exploring the other tools and like get to that eventually. So what do you see as some of the common mistakes that people make kind of early on when they're implementing these systems? Uh, well, what, one thing I had to pick top three. Well, my, my top, top two, my, my top <laughs> one for sure is like literally every company ever everywhere wants to have like multiple APMs running at the same time, and currently, at least in Node, they all just like monkey patch everything, and that tends they don't tend to play nice with each other. So like everything breaks, um, but yeah, I'm I'm working on that. <laughs> it's it's a it's a long, long effort to fix, um, but yeah, like there's in, instability issues. Um, there's like a like, like I said before, like a, a lot of users don't understand most of the most of the products, and like because a lot of companies kind of like pitch tracing is the core thing. Um, they kind of look straight to that and then like um like d depending on like who the like who the specific person is it's gonna actually like look at the ui um it may or may not make sense to them um like d d different organizations will have different people like actually looking like deploying this and like looking at it. it's like there's uh, oftentimes you'll have like like so some companies will have like their dev team will be responsible for like setting up the, the like the APM, and so like they will have the context of like oh yeah like what what routes does the service have like I can look at the trace for like this particular route and that sort of thing. But you like in in other cases you might have like some DevOps person just set this up and they they don't actually know what the, the service does. They just want to know like is is this thing still running? Are are the are the requests that go in coming out the other end is like they, they they want like more high level view of it, but then like gets presented to them in like the wrong way for like what they want. So yeah, kind of need to like in, in my opinion, like you kind of always need to like tailor it for each user and like like ha have a discussion with the user to figure out like like what part of the product did you actually want? Let's show you how to use that. Right. So the same question to you if you had to pick. So first, I want to kind of tail on to what you were saying. Like, for example, your security team probably cares less about traces and a lot more about logs, for example. Like, they want to know if they're being attacked and all of a sudden the sign-in logs are, like, going crazy because you're being attacked by a phishing scam or something like that. And so that is one big thing that I see bigger organizations especially make is that they're not involving all the right people, all the right teams who are going to need to look at this data. And that kind of leads to the two other big things, which are kind of connected in a weird way, but that's monitoring too little like you're picking the very like slimmest amount of metrics you can get and so you're not getting a very good holistic view of how everything's working together uh, so that can be kind of connected but at the same time monitoring too much metrics can also be an issue but that's something that you kind of always like outside of if there's already a predefined like you're in a very predefined space onto what you should be monitoring that's just going to be something you have to deal with as a developer as a DevOps person is kind of testing the waters and figuring out what works for you and your company. 
Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I also find like there's there's a bit of a noise problem with like like some of the some of like some providers um, like. I mean, like, d depending on how you configure it, you're going to get different amounts of data, but, like, you can configure APMs to be, like, quite a fire hose in some cases. And, just, like, the like the, the users kind of have to, like, learn a lot of different things that, like, it, 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 like if you just go and, like, like turn on all the things, like, secur security is definitely an interesting one. Like, there's always new, like, like security monitoring stuff being added to things like what we need to look at like this kind of case like I don't know, maybe like SQL injections we're gonna look for that or like we need to look for like prototype pollution things or like there's like all, all sorts of like different things and like e even like language specific there, there's like a, a lot of these like we need to look at this particular pattern and it's like yeah we, we can like capture that and like make metrics for that or like alerts for that or whatever but we also have to like talk to the users and explain to them like, yeah, like th this is a thing we're we're gonna warn you a bunch about, but you still need to know what the thing is we're telling you about. So, yeah. so um, you know, getting language specific for for JavaScript um, applications, what do you think are the most important things that that folks should pay attention to out of the wide number of metrics that are out there? I would say, so one thing, especially as somebody who worked not so much as a back-end Node.js engineer, I worked, like I said, mainly on the front-end of React, we were dealing a lot with performance metrics around things like I said before, like user experience, latency, making sure that websites loaded in properly. Also a big one that we faced in general as a company, I've heard this from other front-end engineers as well, is third-party apps being integrated in. And then they could occasionally go haywire. And then next thing you know, it's just slowing down your website like crazy or it's Again, possibly a security issue as well, but mainly we were just monitoring to make sure that our end users were relatively, you know, they were having a good experience. Things seemed to be loading at what we considered to be an appropriate time. Things came in right. And some of that was also like, I think we did a lot of, of uh, monitoring in Google Analytics, especially back in, the, back in the day with all of our dashboards and such. And we would be checking how often like uh, buttons and such were being pressed because we had rough ideas on what we were expecting our relative users to do. So we could actually tell when things were broken because we were getting metrics that we were not expecting. Like all of a sudden, a button that's pressed 10,000 times a day is pressed zero, or rather that request, that HTTP request was no longer going. And you're like, okay, it, it's probably like it was missing off the page. It was like a weird CSS bug that got up and the button was no longer working. And you're like, well, yeah, it's kind of obvious in the metrics that it went from 10,000 to zero. You're like, that's, that's a definite uh, something's not quite right. Yep, yep, yeah. Like that, that, that kind of connects to like, like my, my experience is like most APM customers, like they're like the, their biggest issue is like that they're oftentimes like big orgs that they have like probably thousands of different services deployed. They oftentimes don't even know what all of them are or like what versions they are. Like, m like most, most, like m most users are going to be on like super old versions of things in some corners and modern versions of things in other corners and like they don't realize like oh yeah we're actually using this like thing that end like went end of life like seven years ago or something like that or like they're 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 gonna like use vulnerable versions of libraries or things like that and not even realize that and like oftentimes like the, these companies like yeah like it like they won't be aware of this and like we will like make them aware of it basically by just like pointing out like oh yeah you have this vulnerable version of something over there and then like they go and update the thing but like that 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 sort of thing can come out of like oh yeah i updated the thing but i didn't do it right and now like a thing disappeared and like ha having the observability there to see like oh yeah like i i, I thought i was just making this like simple change but like actually like there's a compa like version compa like compatibility issue between like this super old thing and the new thing that I didn't even consider and yeah. it's a good segue to to thinking about and this is the next question is um about how this type of monitoring can help with um security and regulatory compliance um you know security has obviously always been very important but much more so and regulatory now is becoming even more of a thing that people need to think about so um where does server monitoring fit in 
I would say, especially um, we've seen this with our customers and just in general, whenever I read about like security stuff, it's become really important, like certain things like HIPAA, for example, they practically require you to do a certain level of monitoring. And that's actually the case with most security protocols is it's the, uh, they expect you to be monitoring for certain types of attacks or certain types of security vulnerabilities. So if you're not monitoring in what they consider to be an adequate amount, you actually can half the time lose that kind of like, you, you are no longer in compliance, basically. Like it's, it's expected that you will do base minimal monitoring. And one really great example of how this is used in the real world, like how we all interact especially, is with credit cards. Credit card companies are required to do a lot of monitoring. So if you've ever had your credit card stolen physically or you know someone wrote down your numbers and went ahead and gone, gone shopping, at least for me, I've had it happen and they caught it in the first purchase because they are required to do this kind of monitoring. They're required to keep track of me as a person in a, both a good way and a creepy way. But basically they are using those monitoring tools to make sure that your data is safe and that you are in general being treated well as a customer of them, I suppose you could say, and not having your money stolen while somebody goes on a shopping spree. But that's like a very common uh, a use case. Yep, yep, yeah, there's there's lots of different things like, like in, like in like most log monitoring products, they're gonna look for like certain patterns, like credit card numbers get logged in logs all the time. And yeah, that's that's a big problem. Um, but yeah, like a, a, a lot of those like regulatory requirements for like health things or credit cards or if you're doing anything with the government, there's just a lot, a lot of like really strict security requirements and like. Like mo most of them, like you have to know like where like every single like bit of traffic is coming from. Like like every every connection to your server is you have to have a log of like where they connected from and like all all the all the information about that. Um, like oftentimes like you have to have like like HTTP traffic like a log of like yeah like th this IP address was responsible for like the these specific requests and. Like, yeah, be, be able to like provide reports that like, oh yeah, like if if we get attacked or something like that, like you're going to have to get, like do a postmortem later and look up like, oh yeah, the attacks came from this this IP address. So we have to like go through and look at like what like what things did they request? So we know like what which things did they get access to? And like you have to have like, oftentimes there's like network or like like outside of the like. JavaScript world, like yeah, there's like you you need to have like network monitoring and all sorts of different things to like know like like what what traffic is going on. Like if someone like get gets into a container, like there's oftentimes like monitoring for like did they get out of the container into the host and like all all sorts of things like this. That yeah, when when you're dealing with the like regulatory stuff, it gets very complicated. Yeah, so I think. I think it's time to look into the future. So gaze into your crystal ball and try and see what's happening in this space um, and what's going to develop in this space in the future. Um, near future and far future, right? Um, this feels like an area where AI, I mean, AI is going to have tendrils into everything. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like what you think is going to happen in this space in the near, near future and far future. I think in the near future, you're going to see a lot more stuff about security, actually, quite a bit more. Because you've, as we've all been watching the news over the past two years, especially, you just see a lot more attacks. And a lot more companies are getting a lot more cautious, and end users as well. End users are becoming a lot more cognizant of, like, I don't want to give my information to a company that's going to go lose it and get hacked kind of deal. Um, the other thing when it comes to, like, AI... I have to admit, I'm not quite sure where it's going, but I do know it's probably going to start uh, asking questions that we have never asked. It's probably going to be the big thing. It's probably going to start asking monitoring questions that we haven't even thought about asking yet. And it will probably also be able to do things like uh, predictive maintenance and predictive to make sure that there's no downtime and such. And then another big thing that I'm noticing is we keep trending more towards like microservices, which is both, it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but it does make doing application monitoring a little bit more tricky, especially I've heard in Node.js serve environments, it's even more tricky. Apparently there's there's some missing pieces that could be improved basically to make that a bit easier. And so I think that'll be another big thing that we see going forward is more observability tools built around that uh, architecture. Yep. 
Yeah, I, 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 I see the future kind of like a, a big part of it being like more dynamic nature to how we observe things. Um, so like there's like there's a lot of interesting insights that you can get from things, but they're like too expensive to do continuously. Um, and so like like can I you give I, an example. Uh, like if if you I don't know wanted to like uh, what, what's a good example like if, if if you're just like trying to capture like I don't know at like every single promise in the node runtime like there's a lot of them if you, if you want to like get this get the stack like if you wanted to get the stack trace of like where did every single one of these promises come from like you're, you're just going to take down the service um, but it's like you you can you can l look at something and uh, like you can like l look at like patterns in the application behavior to see like oh oh yeah like there's like there's uh, I don't know like CPU spike or something often when it calls this thing so I'm gonna like turn on this extra heavy thing just in this particular case just to like look at that and like there's like I I think gonna be more of that and like. I, I think, like the uh, like one interesting thing that's come up is like e eBPF. Uh, it's like like ha having like external uh, tracing. Like you're listening to like kernel events and things like that. But like like you you can like at runtime turn this on, gather a bit of data and turn it off like just at any time. It's like I I think we're going to see a lot more of just like more generic uh, observability things. Like l less of like a thing focused on the particular language, but more like a generic thing that, like, we're going to start to see these generic things are starting to understand the patterns of runtimes. It's so like, like Node, like, there's V8 in there, and like that's generating a bunch of native code. That's really hard to look at now because no one's really programmed anything to understand how JIT, lit, how like the JIT and V8 is laid out and like how to look at that that memory and like symbolize things to know like. Yeah, like the the name of this function, location, and all that is this, like that currently doesn't really exist. But I think like external tools are going to start to like get that information, and like we're going to have just like powerful tools that are just I'm going to look at everything on the system and see like oh yeah, this is like some random C thing, but I can like infer from the like eBPF like what the rough structure of this thing is, and like identify like oh yeah, like this is a Redis server, so I'm going to like look at it in this way. This is like a node server, so I'm going to look at it in this way. This is like something else, and it's going to like just funnel all of this from the whole system to give you more of like a system level observability thing rather than just application level. Okay, so I think we're going to do one last question before we open it up to Q&A, and so that would just be final thoughts or pieces of advice for folks. My final thought slash piece of advice is that I know, especially even from this panel, it can sound like monitoring, application monitoring can be a little bit of a headache or it's just a lot to take in. It's a lot to go and research and look into, but it's still extremely valuable. I always like to think it's kind of like brushing your teeth every day. Yeah, you maybe it's not maybe like your favorite ritual to do at nights for some of us, but you are sure as heck going to regret it if you don't. This is the exact same thing. It might be a little painful at first, and just like brushing your teeth, you do occasionally have to go and check your monitoring tools. They are, it's not a completely passive process. It's, you know, it's a continuous process you come back to, but it will still pay off a lot more in the end, and it's just important to get it right somewhat in the beginning before, as I told one person, yeah, but once you have the customers and your stuff starts breaking, how long do you think they're going to stay your customers? Because again, there's, there's no room for error really anymore, even, even if you're a small company. My brain is blanking on the question now. That's all right. Okay. Um, so, questions from the audience for our experts. Okay. So it didn't come up here, but um, obviously getting the instrumentation and, and metrics and traces and all that stuff is important. 
But the next most important thing is probably informing uh, your developers with something like alerts. Um, I'm wondering how you all think about that from APM perspectives and and you know the, the work you've done and if there's any particular uh, strategies you've you know would would recommend for for approaching alerting uh, on top of the monitor. So I, I I think that's definitely an area where like AI is going to start to shine a lot is like. It, APM is kind of a data firehose, and like there, there's a lot of like things that could possibly be like an anomaly in some way or another that you'd care about, and like it's 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 very difficult to just define like oh yeah like if if this particular thing happens then like tell me about that because there could be like a thousand possible things. It's like uh, a, a lot of a lot of systems now. Like that's that's the way it works. Is like you you set up like oh yeah if like CPU goes over X then send me an email and like <laughs> that, that 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 like that works okay. But like yeah we, we we need to do better about like understanding more of like what is actually going on to see like like oh oh yeah like th this was normal traffic behavior and this is not. Like it is different in these ways, like maybe that like maybe that is important, and like we need to go and look at that and figure out why it's different, or maybe it's just a high traffic day, who knows, but like you probably want to know about it either way okay. yeah, I would say that uh, at least at my company currently, we have a lot of integrations with things like Slack and PagerDuty. And really where that leaves, I suppose you could say like a gap uh, to an extent, it's not even really a gap, it's more like it's a user error, that's a better way to put it. What that leads to is the fact that the user has to know that the DevOps guy needs to be called when the CPU goes over, or it needs to be somebody else. And what you can do is what actually my company does, which we just have an incidents channel, which pretty much all of our engineering department, including myself, lives in. And so when there's an incident, it just goes to the channel and then multiple on-call people can come and they can figure it out amongst themselves to an extent who's who. But you know, that can be kind of complicated if you're dealing with a larger company, like at a larger company, I would not suggest that as the solution at ours at Mike's work, but definitely not bigger. And even some of our customers, they deal with like real IOT devices in the field and they actually need to text tech, technical text on the field. Like people who are like working in like a, uh, like an indoor farming facility. That is not somebody who's like on Slack. That's somebody who needs to receive a text message when the pressure monitor on the plant is doing weird things. Like it's, it's a very much like you need to know who to contact kind of problem. Like, yes, you need to know what's going wrong, but then who the heck are we contacting about this problem? And do we need to contact multiple people about the problem? But definitely make sure, I suppose, that when you do application monitoring, yeah, do keep in mind that you need alerting systems. Like you need to send a text, a Slack, an email if you're, if you're really risky, you know, <laughs> you got to pick something and start contacting people. Because when things go bad, if it's just screaming into the abyss, it doesn't help anybody. Be great uh, T-shirt for um, uh, a company. <laughs> <laughs> One thing to share uh, at Netflix, we have a single channel. It does actually work pretty well, surprisingly. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> hey, if it works, don't don't br don't break it. If it works, you know. Okay, we got two. I'm gonna go to the the guy in the back real quick. And we got three. Um, thank you. So, got to follow on on you know, brush your teeth, right, or or else. Um, do you see evolution of those tools uh, where we have better impact prediction? Because I know some tools, you know, they show like, okay, impact X amount of users affected, but they kind of tucked away in the corner somewhere, and it's really hard to see. <laughs> uh, but more in the messaging is like, okay, well, if you don't respond to this within the next 30 minutes, right, your impact is going to grow. Uh, you see tools evolving into this and uh, doing a better job with prediction of, of what is going to cost to not act on time? So, at least for me personally, my... Uh, my work experience doesn't uh, revolve quite as much around the impact per se, but I could see that becoming a lot more of a, a common thing with AI integration, that they would be able to make a prediction based on how much users are normally there and how long it estimates something to take to fix 
maybe in the, also the future, AI will be a little smart about like figuring out where the bug might have come from. Maybe it will go and check commit logs and such. And it will be like, huh, this suspiciously happened one minute after this commit went up. I have my suspicions on this. Um, and yeah, I do think possibly that will become more of a thing in the future. And it could also even be updating like a, have you guys have ever seen like when a site's down, they have like a down website where they're like, hey, we're working on it. Here's the like estimation on when it will be fixed. I wouldn't be shocked if kind of like the website you mentioned earlier, like we're under construction, like it could intelligently like put up a warning message that's like, hey, we know that there's an issue here. We're working on it, which I have actually seen a few times, but I'm almost certain that's not AI. I'm almost certain that was like a real person who had to push that up and be like, all right, put up the broken message. We got to let them know. Yeah, yeah the, the, there is a, a lot of products are starting to get into the like cost analytics thing, which I think is like kind of connects to that. Um, m most of them are more so like just covering like pretty much like telling you your AWS bill all over again. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> but like that like so, some of them are starting starting to like get into capturing like oh, oh yeah like th like these these things are responsible for like this this. Like branch of your traffic, like I don't know, like if you have like a I don't know shopping cart system or something, and like the the checkout thing is going to show like oh yeah, like this this percentage of my traffic that like I can attribute to these users, like came from the shopping cart, and so like you you can like connect that to like more like metrics and things like that to capture like, oh yeah, like the, these users have like spent this amount of money going through like this part of the system. And so we can like try and look at like, oh yeah, like if this thing goes down, then that's going to cost us like this, this amount of money. So, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so uh, when AI comes into a picture of uh, performance management, uh, there is a lot of data that we would be looking in the past across different stacks. So with the evolution of AI, uh, there will always be a trade-off between cost and memory. So how do we uh, plan on addressing that in the future? Uh, well, with, with with most performance uh, monitoring products, like it, it's pretty much always just about sampling. Um, it's like we're we're not going to look at like everything ever, but you just have to be kind of intelligent about how you're sampling things. Um, and so like, like, a, 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 like most, most APMs, like they, ha they will have a thing like you can have like sam sample rate rules per route or things like that. And it's like, you, you can say like, oh, oh yeah, like the, this other thing like doesn't happen very often, but I, I want to like still like have in enough information about that. Like e even if like it doesn't actually fit the overall sampling rate, just like give this like every time this gets hit like sample rate of a hundred, uh, like hundred uh, percent, like just because like that thing is important or th like things like that. Um, yeah, just try try to like mess with the configurations of things basically, just to say like oh oh yeah like I, I really need to know about these specific specific things, so just turn up turn up the volume on these, I guess. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, earlier in the in the panel, you brought up that some people actually leverage multiple APMs all at once. Um, like, how? Like, do people <laughs> badly? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> and and what is to gain from like, if anything, from all these different like. I don't know. I, I think like the Node.js context, you know, like how much, like what, what different information would Datadog give me from someone else if you're just hooking into async hooks, no matter what? So the, there's there's lots there's lots of different reasons I've seen companies have more than one APM. Um, there's like sometimes there's like different APMs have slightly different features. Like one one is like more error reporting oriented, and another one's more tracing oriented. Um, you also often get like most APMs are kind of expensive, Datadog included. Um, so, like, customers are sometimes gonna like have like multiples installed to kind of have like a bit of leverage. They're like, oh, like we might switch to these other guys because your bill's a bit much. Um, <laughs> do that sort of thing. Um, 
And there's like so, so, sometimes there's like um, like the, the like so, sometimes like decisions for installing an APM don't come from like that team. It comes from like someone higher up in the organization, and like it can even be like. Like this director over here decided like we're going to use this product and this director over here decided we're going to use this product And like you can actually sometimes get like two different directors have said like you have to use this like these two different products And like the team's just like fine, whatever <laughs> that, That's what you told me to do so I'll do it I guess Thank you <laughs> oh, Perfect, uh, I'll take us home um so something that was mentioned earlier that I found super interesting, like really resonated with me is this idea of trying to better understand like the system level behavior. Um, I think like once you get to a certain size or like say you, know, you have a good culture of you know, instrumentation, um, then really the, the next sort of common problem you see is like a team gets paged at 3 a.m. and then like the adjacent team gets paged and after that it's like four other teams get paged and you have like five people sitting around trying to figure out like, Something just happened. They're trying to figure out something's something's going on, but what's actually going on? And so you need to be able to like draw, you know, relationships or like infer causes and relationships between a lot of the different things here. How do you all kind of see the APM, I guess, like, you know, ecosystem, if you will, evolving to to kind of meet that need? Yep. Well, like historically, like. The, like we, we called ourselves like application performance monitoring for a long time and then like a lot of the industries kind of like tried to shift the like image to like observability now um, and like part of the reasoning for that is like your like your application is not just your code it is your code living on a system that has a bunch of stuff running on it like e even even if you like try and like isolate stuff and like this is a docker container with just this and like even if you like only run this single docker container on this hardware like there can still be like weird stuff in there like it like it, in, unless you like strip things down to like micro kernel system or something like that you, you you can have like linux services like misbehaving randomly sometimes and, like all, all sorts of like different things that like can go wrong that, like Usually it's fine, but like occasionally, like things at like at that level will influence the behavior of your of like your actual like application code, and so like having observability of like the whole thing and not just like this little slice of memory that this process happens to own, like can be valuable. Like kind of depends on like the the depth of like like what what you do and like your ability to actually do anything about it. Like if, if, if something's like, oh yeah, there's like a bug in some like version of Linux or something there, a lot of people's fix is gonna be, let's just update the thing or like roll back or something. Um, but like, yeah, so some, some, some of the users that can do more, like might be like, oh yeah, we're gonna like make a kernel patch or something to fix this like right now. Like, yeah, it, it there's value there, but it depends on like what your scale is. All right, I think that's it for today. Awesome, thank you so much for the presentation. Thanks to the panel, thank you.